Why we disagree about facts. So I've had a lifelong interest in trying to understand how humans perceive the world and each other. And we tend to think of perception as visual perception. So light bounces off of an object, reflects back onto our retinas, which transports the signal along the optic nerve to the visual cortex where some complex information processing occurs, and that's how we view objects. But if that were the whole story, then how is it possible that we can all look at the same facts, the same evidence, the same risks, and arrive at radically different conclusions about what they mean? And that is because our perceptions are inherently social. And the first time that I realized how social the nature of our perception is was during my undergraduate degree where I came across this classic social psychology experiment where Solomon Ash asked participants to match the line you see on the left to one of the three other lines on the right. Now I know what you're thinking. Clearly the answer is C. And that's right. We all have a motivation to perceive the world as it is. But we also have competing motivations, more social motivations. And so the experimenter wanted to see what if all the other participants systematically gave the wrong answer. Would the real subject of the experiment then also conform to the norm of the group or would they still give the accurate answer? And what they found was actually quite striking, that although there was variation on a large number of trials, 75% of individuals at least conformed once, meaning that they willingly distorted their perceptions of reality to conform to the norm of the group. And this is quite striking. Now you might think, what does this experiment from the 1950s tell us about the situation that we currently find ourselves in? And so let me tell you a slightly embarrassing story about myself. My wife and I were at the National Trust not too long ago. Beautiful place, but we hadn't had breakfast yet. And so I went in to the restaurant and I saw the sign that said, almond cake with strawberries. I don't know about you, but I love almond cake. And so I was excited about actually finding that almond cake. And so the only cake, though, that had fruit on it was a picture of this cake. And I started thinking, well, this looks more like a sponge cake. Um, it doesn't really look like an almond cake. And so I wondered, where's the almond cake? So I started walking around the room. I'm very serious about almond cake. So I started walking around the room, and you know, it, was, it was very busy, and there were no waiters, and so the people were sort of looking at me in the queue, like, what is this guy doing? And so I, I just wasn't sure, and I, wanted, I didn't want to leave without the almond cake. So I brought my wife in for a second opinion, and the, the funniest thing happened. She pointed to an entirely different cake, and that cake didn't have any fruit on it. And so I said, well, the sign says almond cake with strawberries, so how can it possibly be that that's the almond cake? And she said, well, you asked for my opinion. I think that's the almond cake, because the cake that you're looking at is clearly a sponge cake. And so I happily distorted my perceptions of reality to conform to the opinion of someone whom I greatly trust and deeply value, and I bought the, I bought the other cake. Now, when I took a bite, I realized it wasn't almond cake. In fact, it was carrot cake, and I really dislike carrot cake. Um, <laughs> But the moral of the story is that we were both wrong. In fact, the delicious almond cake wasn't actually there. They had forgotten. They simply had forgotten to remove the sign. And so it was fake news. <laughs> and I use that term lightly here to denote and question what we actually mean when we say fake news, right? Everyone's using the term fake news now. And I think we're not so concerned about innocent scenarios like that, about jokes, entertainment, possibly just simple human error, that's not what concerns us, right? What's troubling is the spread of misinformation. And not just that, because misinformation is information that's simply false, incorrect, could be due to a simple mistake. I think what we're worried about is the coupling of misinformation with the explicit and deliberate intent to mislead and confuse people, to cause harm to others, and to harm our ability to form evidence-based judgments about important societal issues. And in order to understand the social consequences of fake news, I think it's important to take a step back and sort of examine the way in which humans process information. Now, you might have heard things like confirmation bias, the fact that we no longer pay attention to science, everyone's just following their own opinions. Now, I think that that's bad psychology. In some sense, we can think of this as a spectrum. And so, on one end of the spectrum, we have something called selective attention. 
meaning it's an on and off switch and we selectively attend to the things that we find important and we disregard things that are irrelevant to us and that's completely natural. We need to have a filtering mechanism to try to understand the world. Confirmation bias though is the tendency to process information more fluently when we agree with it, when it agrees with our pre-existing worldviews and beliefs, and stuff that doesn't agree with us is more difficult to process. So we have a bias towards confirming those type of facts that we already agree with, and that's confirmation bias. That works some of the time. At other times, it can be more complicated. What's really troubling, though, is this notion of motivated reasoning. So motivated reasoning is just not only selectively tending to evidence, confirming those facts that fit with your prior worldview, but also to have a deep motivation to then actually reject any evidence to the contrary, to actually distort our perceptions of the facts because they don't fit with what we believe. And what fake news does and the spread of misinformation is it heightens these processes and it pushes us towards more extreme ends of the spectrum. Social media websites selectively target us based on our click behavior, our prior click behavior, right? We tend to click on things that we like, that we agree with, that feeds into an algorithm, and then it feeds us back similar information. And so this process of feeding us opinions that we already like and agree with heightens and amplifies opportunities for selective attention, confirmation bias, and motivated reasoning. And it decreases the valley of open-mindedness. I'm sure you've all heard of the term echo chamber, right? You can think of it as an actual chamber, sticking your head in a chamber, and everyone's just validating everything you're saying, right? Your opinions are awesome. I totally agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. And who doesn't love their opinions being validated? I love it when people agree with me. In fact, there's neurological evidence that shows that when people learn that others agree with them, reward pathways are activated in the brain. And so this is not an inherently bad thing, but when it's amplified and so selective, it becomes increasingly difficult to see what's going on at the other side, to try to understand the other argument at the other end of the spectrum. It polarizes people and it creates conflict, and I think that is the real issue. There's another great psychology experiment. I won't bore you with too many, just one more. Um, it's called the minimal group paradigm. So if I divide half of this room in two and I give one group a yellow t-shirt and the other group a red t-shirt, I'm assuming that you're guessing what's about to happen. Those with the yellow t-shirts will start affiliating with each other, they start liking each other, and they start forming subtle prejudices about those with the red t-shirts. Subtle stereotypes and rumors will quickly dissolve and will start disliking those with the red t-shirts. And that artificial nature of creating group distinctions is very sensitive and it's very quick. And so when we think about major social political events like Brexit, it becomes easy for people to affiliate with the in-group versus the out-group. If you voted to remain, you're in. If you voted to leave, you're out. And we start forming negative views about one another. And again, this creates conflict and tension. So what can we do about this? Is there any way to communicate evidence that doesn't polarize people further? Is there any way to bring people closer together on the science and on issues of mutual interest? There's many important issues, immigration, public health, human rights, inequality, there's many of them. But there's one issue in particular that I'm really worried about, and that is global climate change and the future of our planet. Now, I want to tell you a little about some research we did to try to create resistance to the spread of misinformation and to try to protect public attitudes from the distortion of facts and disinformation. Now, the media called this a vaccine against fake news. One clever journalist called me and I said, hey, is this fake news? Um, I said no. Um, and I believe that that's the correct answer, too. And so, Global climate change, I've studied the psychology of climate change for many years, and I know how difficult it is to accept a fact that implies that we're all part of the cause, right? Psychologically, that's not very comfortable. And so we've been looking for a different type of fact. What if we communicate a fact to people that's not so threatening to our beliefs, that doesn't polarize people further? Before I go into that, I wanted to do a quick quiz. If I'd asked you what percentage of climate scientists have concluded that human-caused global warming is happening, how many would you say? 
How many would vote for less than 50%? Let's do a show of hands. There's a few. How about 50 to 80%? The majority of you think that there's decent agreement, right, between 50 and 80%. How about more than 90%? There's a good show of hands there, too. And in fact, the actual answer is 97%. And that's probably an underestimation of how many climate scientists agree. It's so overwhelming that it's actually 97% of climate scientists. And there's something really intriguing about the psychology of consensus. Because this describes the amount of agreement within a group of people. And so it is inherently a social fact. It tells us how many people agree on something. And another interesting feature about this idea of consensus is that highlighting consensus can reduce misperceived conflict. So imagine you have groups that don't agree with each other. They're very unlikely to take statements about evidence and facts from one another because they inherently distrust each other. But what if there was a third group, a neutral outgroup, that majorities of both groups trusted and were willing to take cues from? That group could serve as a mediator to try to reduce conflict. Now, you might think, who still trusts scientists in a post-truth society? In fact, lots of polls show that both in the United States and the United Kingdom and elsewhere, trust in scientists is actually still very high. And this is not confirmation bias. Now, I quickly showed you the result there. This was not to prime you with the answer. In the experiment, I asked people the exact same question. So I asked participants, we asked thousands of participants, how many scientists do you think agree on the issue of global warming? Then we showed people various statements about facts and misinformation. Then we asked them a bunch of bogus questions about the new Star Wars movie. Of course, they didn't know they were the unwitting participant in a psychology experiment. And then we asked the same question in the end. And what we were interested in is the shift in perceptions of the scientific norm. Now, the reason why this is such an interesting example is because of the disinformation campaigns that have been present in the climate change debate for a very long time. And so there have been concerted efforts to undermine public understanding of the science. Not so much to convince you of alternative facts, but simply to manufacture doubt in the public consciousness about the state of scientific agreement. And the same was true for smoking and lung cancer. And so we wondered, is there any lessons that we can learn from the history of how people have thought about climate change and the types of information that are available about climate change. Now, I love being a scientist because in the lab we can control things and create idealized conditions that don't exist in the real world. And so we wondered, what happened if we just showed people the facts? No misinformation, no fake news, we just show people the facts. So what do you think happened? In that condition, where we just showed people the facts, people were willing to adjust their beliefs in the directions with the scientific norm, right? Most people trended, um, towards the right answer when there's no distracting information. Another group of subjects, we showed an entirely different statement. We showed them this petition, and this is a real petition, this is a screenshot of the petition, that 31,000 scientists have signed a petition saying that their global warming isn't happening and that there's disagreement um, about the issue. Now, there's been lots of fake news stories based on this petition. For example, that thousands of scientists have signed a petition claiming that climate change is a hoax, and this went viral on social media in 2016. And so we thought, well, what happens when people are exposed to this type of misinformation? As you might expect, what happens is that it has a very negative effect, right? It decreases our perception of the scientific norm. But what if we now pair the two together? And this sort of reflects the current media environment, right, where we're bombarded with conflicting cues and we see two different messages and we don't know what to believe. And so what happened when we paired the two together is that the facts were completely neutralized by the presence of misinformation. And this tells a story about the potency of misinformation in neutralizing the power of facts. Right, you might wonder, well, if it's so obvious that so many scientists agree on the issue, why haven't people caught on to this? Because the presence of fake news and misinformation cancels out the effect completely. And so if this is the case, which is rather shocking, is there anything we can do to prevent this from happening? And here is where the vaccine 
comes in. Now, don't worry, this vaccine doesn't require a needle, but I'll briefly explain how it works. So basically, it relies on a biological metaphor, that just as injecting yourself with a weakened strain of a virus triggers antibodies in our immune system, which then help confer resistance against future infection, the same can be achieved with misinformation and information. And so essentially, inoculation theory, which is a psychological theory, it basically suggests that we can extract a bit of the DNA from the misinformation and use it against itself. And the way that this works is as follows. In the partial vaccine condition, we warn people preemptively that there's politically motivated actors that are trying to influence us by using misleading tactics. For example, you might hear that there's a lot of disagreement among scientists about climate change, but in fact, that this is nonsense and that 97% of scientists agree. In the full vaccine condition, what we did is we pre-bunked the misinformation. Debunking is not that effective because issuing corrections after the fact are simply not as effective. Think about it like this, right? It is better to try to prevent an accident from happening than treating someone after they had an accident. And so what we're trying to do is play offense rather than defense. And so what happened here is we told people, well, you might hear of this petition, but you shouldn't actually buy into this petition because the signatories on this petition include Charles Darwin, members of the Spice Girls, and all kinds of other individuals that are actually either no longer alive or on show business and things like that. And so there's actually no scientific evidence to support this petition. And so what happened in these conditions is that when people were preemptively inoculated against a petition, when they were shown the full misinformation condition at the end, they were less resistant and less influenced by the misinformation. Now, I'm not trying to sell you a magic vaccine here. As you can see, the vaccine conditions recuperated about one third and two thirds of the original effect, but it's promising. And what's especially promising is that we observe this effect across the ideological spectrum. So in the condition where the two information conditions were paired against each other, there was clear evidence of confirmation bias. Those people who already believed one side tended to gravitate towards those facts, and people who disagreed tend to gravitate towards the other side. And that breeds room for processes like selective attention and confirmation bias. But we did not find this in the inoculation conditions. It didn't matter what end of the political spectrum you were on, what your prior beliefs were, the inoculation was effective in that it brought people closer together towards the conclusions of climate science and it reduced polarization. So in a time where our value sets are not overlapping, there is an opportunity to unite people by a common interest not to be duped by fake news. And a good colleague of mine, John Cook, said this, and I think that this actually resonates quite well. Now, the real power of this vaccine is in its ability to share it socially. If you know a fake news story is coming out and your friends haven't seen it yet, there is an opportunity to inoculate people interpersonally, to actually spread the vaccine socially. Just as regular vaccines can create herd immunity against the spread of a contagion, we can create societal resistance against fake news by inoculating each other against the spread of fake news. And the last thing I'll say, and I think this is an idea worth sharing with you, is that this vaccine does not require a needle. It is freely available, open access for everyone to use, and most importantly, pre-existing conditions are extremely welcome. Thank you.